Good evening. I'm Stuart Brand. I'm from Holder's Catalog, and it sort of suffuses the building tonight. I'm also from the Long Now Foundation. Another bit of orientation is right over that way is the uh, Long Now Bar called the Interval, right next to Greens. They'll be open till 12:30 tonight, just in case you want to keep partying after uh, the after party, because they're going to kick us out of this pier. Uh, which is run by Santa Fe Art Institute, or Santa Fe, San Francisco Art Institute, um, and then uh, you can carry on in the wee hours if you want to. Um, this whole event was organized by people I want to introduce, Ryan Phelan and Danica Remy. And yeah. Ryan's the Danica, <laughs> Ryan's the... Uh, Curator Danica's uh, uh, development and maker happen of things, and you guys can probably explain a little bit of the house rules tonight. Do you need a mic? I, I don't think we need it. I think we're mic'd. mic'd up. Yeah, we're mic'd. So, <laughs> thank you, Stuart. Um, and welcome, everyone, to this evening's program. When we conceptualized what to do to celebrate the whole Earth 50th, we thought, what could be better than four in-depth conversations? Now, they're kind of compressed into 25-minute segments, but... We tried, um, and we wanted to take four really important themes from the Whole Earth Catalog, and you have that information in your brochure today, as well as uh, bios on the speakers. So we're going to try to really run this as promptly as we can with my co-host here. Um, one other thing, I, Stuart mentioned the after party, and just want to make sure everyone is thinking about making plans to come over at the end this evening and join the rest of the alumni that have been honestly partying all day <laughs> next door. So, Danica, what else? And then I'd like to bring the volume down a little bit and uh, remind everybody that we have uh, 143 issues of Whole Earth Coevolution Quarterly and the catalogs on display. And it's quite amazing to walk the line from 1968 all the way to 2002 when we stopped um, publishing. And so I hope you'll enjoy the art, the covers, and the conversations about where you were um, when you read one of those or what you were doing at the year that those were published. I encourage all of you to hashtag Whole Earth 50th and hashtag stay foolish and stay hungry um, and take uh, no flashes in the theater, please. Um, but when you get into the after party, um, we encourage photos all over the place. So please enjoy. And hashtag SFAI, our host for this evening, San Francisco Art Institute, um, who have graciously given us the atrium next door. So with that, with that. See you guys in a few minutes. Uh, I'll be back at the end of the program. I'm just here one more second to introduce the first perspective giver on things. There's all these faux images of Earth. You know, that's a photograph, and, and that thing's just a fun ball. But um, it's best to hear from somebody who's seen it raw, the Apollo 9 astronaut, Rusty Schweikert. Thank you, Stuart. Ryan and, and uh, Danica. Uh, this is the 50th anniversary of the Whole Earth Catalog. It also is the 50th anniversary of human beings seeing that whole Earth with their own eyes in, in the blackness of space. Um, it's the 50th anniversary, especially for me, of the uh, Apollo program. And uh, uh, not only do we celebrate uh, the intersection of the Whole Earth Catalog and the Apollo program uh, today, but uh, 50 years ago was the same. Uh, the intersection was there 50 years ago. It all started, um, the, the Whole Earth Catalog with Stuart uh, and, and, and the Whole Earth, uh, with Stuart uh, stoned one day and writing this, uh, uh, th this historic thing. Why haven't we seen... Uh, you know, a photograph of the whole earth. And of course, Stuart then went around wearing a sandwich board and uh, we all know the story. Uh, I've always chuckled at that, but uh, Stuart was not the first person who had the idea. Uh, Fred Hoyle uh, made this wonderful statement back in 1948. 
And I think this is the essence of what we're really talking about today. Human beings have now had that view. And the first people who had it were, um, I got to go back one there. The first people who had that vision were uh, the Apollo 8 crew as they went out around the moon in, at Christmas time in 1968. And um, this is what Bill Anders uh, saw when he looked out the window, uh, the real blackness of space, not with the earth in the view or the sun, but just the stars. And that made a huge impression on him. Um, this is a, a slightly different picture. When he looked at it another time, without the sun and the earth shine on the moon, the moon interfered with that, and he really understood the blackness of space. Three orbits later, they went around the first three orbits going backward around the moon, and it was pretty boring watching the craters. But they turned around on the fourth orbit, and this was what they, the sight they saw coming over the horizon. This was the first time human eyes had seen this beautiful planet contrasted against the, the grays of the moon and the blackness of space. To me, this was the moment of cosmic birth, the moment when humans first left the womb of Mother Earth and moved out into the universe. This is historically the moment we're living it now. That's a moment of 10,000 years, perhaps for long now, or perhaps a, a few dozen years. But this, was, this is the important element. We are born out of the womb of Mother Earth. It is only as human life is born out of the womb that it begins to appreciate love and begin to take care of its mother. And we, as we move out into the cosmos, must both love and look back at and take responsibility for the mother from which we emerged. You'll hear that theme again and again. So this is our responsibility, and we must accept this responsibility as we move out into space. Thank you. Thank you, Rusty. I'd like to invite uh, Stephanie Mills to the stage. I'm, I'm so sorry, <laughs> Kevin Kelly. Excuse me. No panic, Stephanie. Kevin Kelly. And <laughs> I want to. And I just want to say, Kevin Kelly came on the scene in 1984 almost by mail order. Uh, Stuart was in a panic. Uh, he was in the thick of trying to do the whole software catalog, and he'd been corresponding and uh, exchanging columns with Kevin. And Kevin came to our rescue, and the rest is history. Great. Thank you so much. So I want to talk about um, the other part of um, what you see on the cover of the Whole Earth Catalog. What you see, of course, at first, is the Whole Earth and that cosmic overview that Rusty just talked about, that almost transcendent uh, view that you get of our own life. But beneath that on the cover, anyway, is the second news, and I think the second revelation, which is access to tools, which is, I think, almost as important as the overview of the whole Earth. Access to tools connotates that you're going to do something with tools, and what we normally do with tools is make things. And so what I want to talk about is the connection between the whole Earth catalog and the maker movement that we see today. And it was a very direct line, I believe. Um, what the catalog was being used for in a lot of people was not necessarily trying to give them a new perspective on the environment or the planet, but they needed to know how to dig a well. They were going to go back to the land and they needed to figure out how to build a roof. Or they wanted to try to homeschool their kids and they wanted some suggestions about curriculum. It was about how to do stuff, how to make things, how to make things happen. And that how-to was what the catalog was selling, so to speak, in the very beginning. And it made a huge difference. I think um, many people can testify the fact that the whole Earth catalog changed their lives, and they changed their lives because it told them how to do things that they didn't even know that they wanted to do. 
it told them how to do things they wanted to know how to do, but it most importantly, it opened up this gate way to possibilities about things they didn't even know that they wanted to do. And I think that enlargement of the possibility space that tools bring is one of the great nudges that the whole earth catalog made to our culture. It kind of opened up the possibility space. And so people like myself who encountered it for the first time said, wait a minute, you can actually, you know, build your own house. You can actually buy dynamite and blow up a boulder. You can actually figure out how to, to um, have bees in your backyard. That's all possible. I didn't even think about that before. And now I have that possibility because I know that these tools exist. I know that this information exists. And so I think there was this aha that the culture had where it was um, taking a long American tradition of doing things on your own, making stuff in basements. Anybody who grew up on a farm would realize that there were makers, the farmers are makers by necessity. But there's two things that were different this time. One was this enlargement about the kinds of things that you could learn how to do yourself. It wasn't just fixing farm machinery, it was learning how to pan for gold. It was learning how to program a programmable calculator. It was, um, exp you know, it was learning how to knit in an old-fashioned way that had died out. All these things were now something that you could learn how to do, not just the things that your grandfather or grandmother knew. And secondly, I think it sped up accelerated the rate of learning. And it accelerated it in a, in a very major way where before, if you wanted to find out how to do something, it was almost impossible to f connect with that correct information. Libraries were very, very small. Bookstores were pathetically understocked. There was simply no way to find out how to do these things. We, we don't really even remember how, how bad it was. And so this acceleration has only gained speed. So, so now we have the extension of the Whole Earth Catalog, which was the web, and then we have an extension of that web, which is YouTube. And I think as we look at this movement to take tools and to make things and to expand our possibilities, I think of no better example of the way in which the acceleration has happened other than the millions of YouTube videos of people who have taken what they know and they're sharing it and telling other people how to do what they have learned to do. And that acceleration is really, really underappreciated right now. It's, it's massively important, massively faster than any way we could have imagined. And I think a lot of the stuff that we're seeing worldwide in terms of people making things, starting things, making things happen has be been because the access to tools that the whole earth initiated has accelerated and expanded in the form of YouTube and has gone on to really change what we think about as culture. And as an indication of the importance of YouTube, I want to introduce the next speaker who is a YouTube maker star. Simone Yurtz is a maker, innovator, creator, inventor, who has a massive YouTube following. And um, she began a channel about what she called shitty robots. She has a sense of humor. She's an entertainer as well. And she'll be up here to um, tell you about sort of this next phase of the maker movement. Simone. Hello. Thank you so much, Kevin. My name is Simone, and yeah, I'm a maker and inventor. I kind of go between the two titles, depending on what mood I'm in. I like inventor, because it makes it sound like I'm in a cartoon. Um, but I'm, I'm definitely a maker and part of the maker community, uh, but maybe more so in maker entertainment. And I run a YouTube channel where I build different projects, mostly robotics, or that's what I'm mostly known for, shitty robots. And Whenever somebody doesn't, hasn't seen them and I say that I build shitty robots, they're like, don't talk yourself down. <laughs> and I'm like, no, but they're supposed to be shitty. That's the whole point. So here, just to show you some examples, here's an alarm clock that I made to help me wake up in the morning.
this video on different platforms has been seen around 80 million times, which probably makes me the person on all of planet Earth that most people have seen getting slapped in the face with a rubber hand. And I'm not sure what type of legacy that is, but I'll, I'll take it. Here's a lipstick robot that I made because makeup is hard. And here's a robot that I made to help me serve soup. This one takes a little while, so it's probably going to eat up the rest of my time here for the intro. But let's wait for the punchline. <laughs> Maybe I'm more in the business of keeping a straight face more than anything. Um, but yeah, without more further ado, let's bring Kevin Kelly back out. Maybe we should progress the slide, or maybe we should just keep this. It's, it's a pretty, it's a good frame. <laughs> so our, our purpose now is to kind of think about um, the role of making in the world, the role of being able to allow people to make new things, and um, one of the um, other attendees here um, tonight is, is Neil Gerstenfeld, who runs a, a fab lab, and one of his points is that the seemingly direction that we're going to is that we'll get to the point where the tools will be so available and cheap that basically at some point in most people's lives, they will make something, just like today in most educated middle class um, lives, people will write something. You know, it, writing yeah. in the past, a thousand years ago, would have been an almost impossible thing for most people to do because they weren't even literate, and they had very little occasion to have to write anything. But now writing is a common thing that everybody does. And I think making is headed in that same direction. You won't make most of the things in your lives, but you'll make something at some point in your life. And I wonder if you have any kind of feelings about... Um, whether you felt that you are a maker now because the tools are easier, or why are you making things, and you know, would you have made them uh, 10 years ago? Well, 10 years ago, I was a teenager and not really interested in robotics. Uh, robotics. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think definitely, I so badly want the maker movement to be this kind of antidote to consumerism and be an alternative to or instead of buying things, you make things, and instead of throwing things away, you fix things. But I've kind of been looking at the pattern of how I'm making, and I realize it's mostly just me buying a bunch of materials and tools. And it's like, it's, it's in some way, it's easy for it to become a little bit like a gear sport. And I, like, maker spaces are a good compromise in that, where it's like, oh, we can give people access to tools and access to making without having to get all these ex this expensive gear. But yeah, I don't know. Of course, tools getting cheaper, like they're being Raspberry Pis for $3 or $5. It's, I mean, it's, it's huge. It's such a game changer. You can take the risk of making mistakes when you're not gambling huge investments. And um, did you... When you were growing up, you said you were a teenager, you weren't thinking about robotics. When did you start thinking about robotics? When did you kind of realize, oh my gosh, I, even I, could be making robots? It's, it was honestly not until I saw another woman give a lecture on robotics. Um, and she was, she was this hardware hacker, and I remember seeing it, because like, I grew up with a really geeky older brother who would pick computers apart and who would program and stuff like that, but I was always like, no, that's not for me. And it wasn't until I saw another woman that I could kind of project myself onto that I was like, wow, if she can do that, then I can do that too. And it suddenly was like, just this like, what do you say, curtain fell down? There was a aha moment. Maybe that's the... Yeah, Simone grew up in Sweden until very recently, so... <laughs> I was a... Curtain you were fall like, down, yes. It, uh, yeah. do, do you not say that? Oh, God damn it! I mess up idioms all the time. It's, it's how people catch me. 
But I asked you, I was like, you were like, what do you want me to say when I enter you? And I was like, tell people I'm Swedish. <laughs> and you're like, no. <laughs> but it's just nice to know that I might mess things up. Yes. Yeah. The curtain <laughs> fell down from my, from my ignorant face, and I saw the world of making, and I, as a woman, can do this too. <laughs> Um, so, so do you have any, any sense of like, uh, do you wish you had access to more tools? Do, do you, what, what would you need if you could wave a magic wand to kind of make your life richer in terms of making things? Is it cheaper tools, more tools, more time, uh, more information? Honestly, at this point, it's just more time. Like that's definitely the limiting factor. And it gets to this weird point when you're like, I mean, I started my YouTube channel three years ago, and I was just like doing these projects that are fun, and I started putting them online. And it's like grows to this point when you kind of start a company and you're like running more of a business where it's like, I don't have time to make things anymore. Um, so I really wish that I had more time. Yeah. That's the biggest. So we should make a machine that made more time, right? Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's actually, I mean, I feel like a lot of people have tried to attempt that, but yeah. uh, I'll, I'll give it a go. <laughs> but I'm, I'm kind of interesting, interested in, like, when did the word maker come around? Do you remember when people started identifying themselves as makers? Because now it's definitely a thing where people are like, I'm a maker. I, I actually think it was a marketing term devised by Dale Dodery, who um, worked for Tim O'Reilly and wanted to do a magazine that was about, like, cool tools about how to make stuff, and they... He came up with this idea of maker, and um, that seemed like a, it's like wired. It was a really good name. It was really short, a few letters, mm -hmm. and it and it kind of took off. So there's the you know the maker fair, and and I, I didn't really kind of um, talk about the lineage, but I I think it was to me it was no accident that the the maker fair and the maker movement and the maker magazine that kind of all came out of San Francisco. I think there has been a long trend trajectory of um, d making your own things as something that was sort of honorable. And I think there is a connection between um, the maker mindset and Silicon Valley, this, this willingness to do something on your own. And that was, again, the whole Earth catalog motif, which was do it yourself, start your own thing, um, do your own thing. And that has... Um, transition to the maker, and I think it was at the beginning of Make Magazine. Yeah. I really like the term maker because as a YouTuber, people also call you a creator. So I'm both a maker and a creator, which makes me sound like I'm God. <laughs> which is great. You're, okay. but you are, right? <laughs> also really humble. Really humble. Well, uh, hum a humble God. A yeah. humble God. <laughs> like the lesser one. A little bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so I, I think, um, uh, and I, I don't know about you, but I spend many hours a night watching YouTube videos about how to make things. I learned how to weld that way. I learned how to electroplate metals by watching YouTube clips, and it's something I could not have learned just reading a book. And I don't know, do you find the same thing? Are you learning how to do things on YouTube? Yeah, I mean, you turn to YouTube all the time. It's, yeah, it's, it's so readily available, and it's, it's just crazy. And I feel like there's, I mean, of course, it's like the issue of quality control. Like, how do you trust the people making these videos? But then you just read the comments, and there, if somebody is an expert and they're doing it wrong, like, the first comment is going to be somebody being like, <clears throat> actually, it's called uh, XYZ. <laughs> Yeah. So, are you finding that people watch you to learn how to make things? No. <laughs> I am... <laughs> Because that would be really scary. Yeah, but I, I'm utterly uneducational. Um, but, I mean, and it was kind of a choice that I made when I started my channel, because I was like, I started building these things as a way to learn, and, and a lot of people do tutorials around, especially around robotics and electronics, and I was like, I'm not in a position to teach people. Like, that's not, I'm, I'm a hobbyist. Like, I'm a happy hobbyist who happened to get a, a big audience. Um, and I think there's a lot of people who do such a great job of tutorials. So I guess I could get away with saying that it might be inspiring. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's something. Maybe somebody watches it and they're like, yay, I also want to build stuff. Or if she can do that, I can do better. 
It started as a compliment and then ended as an insult. I really like it. <laughs> Great. No, but I feel like it's also, I mean, to me, like, engineering and approaching engineering is really daunting because there's a lot of, like, it's, it's a scary process. It's something that's really scary to teach yourself and to take on. And also, in engineering, there, there's a lot of, like, kind of expert culture. And for me, setting out to build shitty robots was a way to kind of, like, deflate that and be like, hey, I'm not setting out to be an expert, and people can criticize me for building this project. But I was just doing it for fun. Um, I, I just feel like people, you kind of want to avoid a culture where people are scared of doing, making mistakes. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the the um, uh, benefits of, of your videos is that you allow yourself to to make mistakes. You 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 sort of celebrate in a sense things that don't work as a means to inspire other people to you know make things that do work. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> or maybe it's just this is the start of the idiocracy. This is how it how it goes on. <laughs> um, so, so um, w one of the things that um, I'm really interested in is sort of where this goes into the future and, and how the maker movement, how doing it yourself might continue to evolve and where it might go in another 10 years or 20 years. Have you ever thought about, well, if things continue the way they do in this world of makers and creators, in 10 years it'll be like, what? Do you, do you have a vision? I think it's more that like we won't won't do the same. I mean, now in school or in education, there's so much about learning a thing, um, and what I hope to see more is learning to learn because now it's like things are evolving so fast. You can't really know everything or be an expert in a field um, because things are evolving really, really fast. So it's like you just have to know how to find information and how to figure it out and how to solve problems. So I hope that that's like, and that goes beyond the maker movement. That goes kind of beyond everything, but just what it means to be human these days. Yeah, I, I would agree wholeheartedly. I think that the, the central curriculum of any kind of, say, high school level graduation would, would be knowing how you, knowing how to learn, and specifically knowing how I learned best. Knowing how each person to graduate with knowing how they learn the best in all the different situations. And that super skill of, of learning how to learn and optimize for yourself so that you knew exactly how you learn best would be really the thing that you want to graduate with. How do you learn best? Well, you know, I think the thing about it is is that it's actually I've been searching and I've not found a single curriculum that would teaches you how to learn, how to learn, and none that teaches you how to optimize your own learning. And so, um, uh, we don't know. I mean, I don't know how I learn best. I would really like to know that, but I think that is the meta skill, that is the super skill that you would like people to graduate with. And, and I think it would take a lot of work. I think it would take a lot of teaching, testing, trying things, and training to be able to do that. So it's not something you could absorb by itself. I think it would be something, a liter like a literacy that you would have to be taught and you would graduate with. And I think that would be the thing that, that schools should pride themselves on teaching and really the only thing you need to do when you graduate. So instead of having like, what are they called, like Meyer-Briggs personality categories, you have learner categories. Yeah, exactly, right. And you're like, you're people, this type of learner. People have, are all different types of learners and so you still have to learn how to learn in different situations, but you would understand how you learn best in those different situations. And that would be the ultimate maker skill. What is the thing you learned recently? Other yeah. than welding. Um, I, I've been uh, playing around with electro uh, nickel plating, and then I'm learning, teaching myself how to edit video, and I've graduated from iMovie to Premiere Pro. Yeah! <laughs> uh, so, and how about you? What have you learned recently? What have I... Oh, I did not expect to get that question bounced back at me. <laughs> I know. What have I learned recently? Um, I mean, I'm learning, I'm starting a product development company, so I'm learning a lot about manufacturing, and there's a lot to learn about it. Um, but I really, I really want to learn welding. I have a welding station, I have a fume extractor, I have a welding hood. 
I just need to learn. <laughs> yeah. I also have a fi fire extinguisher. A fire extinguisher, yeah. yes. Two fire extinguishers, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is good, yeah. Yeah. No, I, th I, think, I think that's, again, that's the inspiration f that, that for me, the whole Earth Catalog, is that you can learn new things, you have these possibilities, and, you know, uh, you go through the pages and you're like, oh, that you can do this, you can, um, you know, preserve uh, skulls with, with bleaching, whatever. I was like, I didn't know you could do that, now you can. And so, right? So you, really you, inspiring. You, <laughs> a lot of people are going to take this to heart. <laughs> or is it just your own skull? Is yeah. this like the new beauty trend? But it's like, yeah, get yeah. really bright skeleton. Yes. Yeah. I, it's, you have to use hydrogen peroxide. That's the secret. Mm. Don't use bleach. Use hydrogen peroxide. <laughs> Everybody taking notes? Yeah? Okay, cool. So, um, I, I, anyway, um, do you have anything else that you, what would your advice be for people who are making things? In 30 seconds. Yes. Um, really cherish your enthusiasm. We're really good at teaching people how to be duty driven and be diligent about doing things. And I've noticed that for myself, a much better fuel is if I'm genuinely excited about something and that's when I really get shit done. Uh, but it requires a lot of taking care of yourself and making sure that you have the right perimeters. So um, just figure out, figure that out. That's <laughs> rubbish advice. Not quotable at all. That's not getting quoted <laughs> like a fancy photo on well, Instagram. Well, say it in Swedish, and that will work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All righty. What about you? Um, I, I think the thing is, is um, uh, begin with failure. I mean, count on the fact that you're going to fail and that failure is to be accepted and actually welcomed. So the first things you do, the t second things, even the third things aren't gonna work. And that's just perfectly okay. And you should really embrace that. So make stuff that fail. Yeah. All right. Plus one. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Simone. Danica. And next up, I'd like to ask Howard Rheingold to come up to the stage. I had originally met Howard and... I originally met Howard in 1991 when for a moment someone thought I could be the publisher of Whole Earth, of which I knew I could never be. So I've been very grateful that Howard took that leadership. <laughs> so 1968 was the year that not only did the Whole Earth Catalog first appear, but it was the year I graduated from college and headed out into the world. Things are pretty fucked up now, but um, 1968 was, was kind of apocalyptic. And, and I think that, that like probably most of the people in, in this room um, who are old enough, I, I carried that first Whole Earth Catalog from place to place with me for, for quite a while. It was both a, an, an aspirational guidebook to how I might design a life for myself, um, but also it was a, an, an inspiration and an invitation to try to repair what was going on in the world. And a, a strong sense that, that you get from looking at the video or looking at those old catalogs that, that there was a community of people who were doing this. I didn't really join the enterprise for about 20 years uh, when I got involved with the well and started spending an inordinate amount of time hanging out online with what my wife called my imaginary friends, who, uh, <laughs> many of whom are out here. Uh, and I didn't really think about community until I was challenged by, by Kevin. Now, Kevin tried to get me to write for Whole Earth, uh, by, uh, but I, I, I couldn't afford to do that. I was trying to make a living as a writer, and he only paid $250. So he, he would come to my house and provoke arguments, and uh, he challenged me to explain to him why I thought the well was like a community. And then he said, what you just said, write that down, I'll pay you $250. So that, 
that, that made the same enterprise seem a lot easier. It, that article was published in 1987. It took some years to get a contract to write a book about people communicating through computer networks because uh, editors kept telling my agent that only electrical engineers would, would want to do that and they wouldn't sell very many books. Almost immediately after writing the book, I started getting a lot of flack from critics and, and academics and scholars, and I, I didn't aspire to be a social scientist or a scholar. I was just trying to write a, a book and, and, and make a living as a, a writer. Um, but immediately, the criticism came that, well, these aren't really communities, and, and in fact, you're, you're, you're degrading the idea of community. So. Um, I started thinking about that, but I didn't really drill down on it until about 2005 when I started teaching college students about virtual community and what's now called social media. And looking into it, I discovered that a sociologist came up with 95 different definitions of community that you could find in the social science literature. So um, we can define community, but it's not a definition that everybody is going to accept, and it's not a, an objective definition that, that exists in the world outside of our, our wrestling with what uh, community is. And in many senses, it's a projective test about our hopes and, and fears about the way our lives and, and the world seems to be changing, largely because of the advent of communication technologies. And in fact, sociology started when Ferdinand Tunnies in the 19th century started writing about the way life was changing when people moved from villages to cities and from norms and customs to contracts. He, he called it, um, oh, my mind's gone blank on it. Um, does anybody remember what those words are? <laughs> oh, uh, so th back then it was modernity that was happening. And now, of course, the changes that come in our, our cities and our, our social lives through communication technologies are so much more global and are happening so much faster. And we're discovering that there are all kinds of great communities out there. And there are also Nazis and incels and terrorists and gamer gators. Uh, community seems to have this aura of being this nice thing that used to exist, but doesn't anymore. But it's something that keeps changing, and people who don't have uh, nice ideas can have communities too. So there's more to say about this, but fortunately we have some time to, to talk about it, so I'm going to invite Chip Conley to come up and talk for a minute. I'm doing my best to keep up with Howard's wardrobe. Pretty impressive colors. And I just before I get started, I just want to say to Stuart, when I started my uh, first company, Joie de Vivre Hotels, um, 32 years ago, the first thing I had in my business plan was start cheap, small, and local, which I learned from you, from Whole Earth Catalog. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to take us back, actually, a, a lot longer. I'm going to take us back to 1910. Um, E.M. Forster wrote a book, uh, Howard's End, started the book with an epigraph, only connect. But what you don't know is probably is a year earlier he had written a book or written a short story called The Machine Stops. And the Machine Stops was all about how, in essence, it's basically where we are today, to be honest with you. It's how the machine actually became the intermediary in terms of our connections. So almost exactly that same time, Emile Durkheim wrote a book uh, and, and uh, coined a phrase, coined a term, collective effervescence. He studied religious pilgrimages and studied how communities came together and what happened when communities came together around a certain mission is that their ego evaporated and a communal joy emerged. Well, I've experienced that at Burning Man <laughs> for about 25 years. And I'm on the board and I as I spent more time imagining collective effervescence of a community, I spent a few years, um, I created a website called Fest 300, 
that featured the 300 best festivals. Oh, thank you. Featured the 300 best festivals in the world. My job was to be the most interesting person in the world to go around to all these festivals and experience collective effervescence in community. Now, I was doing this at exactly the time that URLs were awash in them, and yet people needed this IRL experience, um, the in-real-life experience. Um, I saw that as a boutique hotelier here in San Francisco where I connected our guests who come uh, to our hotels with locals. We call it the Golden Gate Greeter Program where we connected locals with uh, people visiting the city. And then for the last five and a half years, I've been at Airbnb with, uh, helping the young founders uh, steer the rocket ship and in charge of community globally for Airbnb for um, four of those five and a half years. And my role was to actually help bring an online community, the, uh, especially our host community, together in person on occasion. Uh, and we did it exactly at Fort Mason, our first host uh, community event in person uh, in 2014. 1,500 hosts here, 6,000 hosts in, uh, in Paris a year later, and then 20,000 hosts a year later from 110 countries. And the thing that I noticed more than anything was the idea that IRL and URL are not at odds. <laughs> you know, the idea of connecting with people uh, online and then figuring out how to meet in person so we, our mirror neurons could dance together, which is something that's hard to do online, um, is what we have in the you know, for the future. And so m the last thing I'm going to say before I bring Howard back out is... I want you to close your eyes for a moment. Close your eyes. I'm going to do the same. And imagine when you hear the word community, what is meaningful to you around that word? What does it conjure up for you? What is it that community does? What community do you think of that actually brings a smile to your face and a, a spirit to your soul and as you think about that community, ask yourself, is it in real life or is it URL? And with that, I'm going to ask you to open your eyes. And Howard, come on back on stage and we're going we're gonna to arm wrestle about virtual versus in person. Hi. Hi. Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. <laughs> well, you know, you've, you've had that jacket since the mid-80s, if I'm not mistaken. Correct? Yeah. I, I wore it because it was in the film. And yeah, exactly. So it still looks good. Cheers. So uh, what are we going to talk about? We've got a community here in this room, and they're in real life. What, the thing I would like to ask you is, what do you think about URL versus IRL? Is it a versus or is it an and? Is it, you know, what do you think? Well, one, one of the, the reasons I felt that, that the well was very community-like, and it's something that I think all of us still experience, is that we were able to connect with people that, that we either shared an interest with or, or sparked some, some, some kind of attraction that, um, that we might not otherwise have connected with. And, you know, many of those people remain imaginary friends. Some of them are on the other side of the world. But there's, there is almost kind of gravity that, that draws people together. So I'd say that uh, maybe more than half of the people that I know now are people that I originally met online. So, and, you know, you mentioned Burning Man when... Um, and I, I guess 1994 and 1995, when a, a lot of techies started going to Burning Man, uh, I remember people remarking that it wouldn't be possible without email, and that a, a lot of what brought that community together just had to do with the, the infrastructure for connecting people. And when I started thinking about what, what was unique about this new computer-mediated communication, I thought, well, you can connect with people that that you want to connect with even if you didn't know them. And it's a many-to-many -many medium. 
But it, it, at times, looking at social media and how we see these tribes who then are fighting with another tribe and, and frankly don't have necessarily civil decorum in terms of how they communicate, how, how do we solve for that? I mean, I, it's funny, other fact is it's the 50th anniversary of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. <laughs> and like back then, you know, 50, yeah, let's, I saw that doc. I flew from Miami to San Francisco. I had a speech in Miami this morning, strangely enough. And um, I flew today and I watched that film on the way back. And it's interesting to look back to that era 50 years ago, Mr. Rogers and the neighborhood, the community, and there was almost like a, a civil decorum that goes on. Why, why is it that we've so fallen off that path in the virtual or the digital world? Well, I don't think I don't think people, or have we? I don't think people have have become more coarse, coarse and vulgar and mean. I think it's just more easily visible uh, wow. to us now. And you know this idea that communication technologies are changing community not for the better is not a new idea. Robert, Robert Putnam wrote about uh, bowling alone and the decline of social capital in America and, and what he correlated it with, and he tried correlating it with everything else, race relations, women entering the, the workforce, and he, what he ultimately correlated it with was the, the rise of people watching television all the time. So, well, there are a couple of things that, that I think are are important. One of them is the public sphere, and I'd, I'd like to talk about that. But I think the other thing we need to talk about is that community is not this thing that used to exist or that exists in an ideal form. It's something that we should wrestle with, and particularly since things are changing more rapidly. For what Tunney's was involved with was a, a change that, that suddenly changed the way people had lived in their villages for thousands of years. Now we get that kind of epical change is on a decade mm -hmm. basis. Yeah, I, I mean, I recently, uh, I recently found out I have prostate ch cancer uh, less than four weeks ago. And uh, I was able to connect with a community of people. And I'm inter it's intermediate stage, so it's, you know, it's something that's concerning. In the past, I'm not sure if I didn't have an online way to actually research it and then listen to people who actually have had it, similar stage to where I am, and then actually go out and communicate with them and to have all of that as an experience in the last four weeks. And then, frankly, to have the IRL experience as well as, no, oh, here's a meetup of people who are talking about that. To me, it's, a, it's, a, it's glorious that I have two different paths to actually have that kind of experience that helps me feel like I'm not alone. Well, you know, in, in fact, in 1986, one of the things that, that really coalesced the idea of community around the well was when, when Phil Kett's son came down with leukemia and we created an online support group overnight. Now there's jillions of online support groups. 1986, that was a new thing. So uh, that was 1986, but nine years ago, I came down with cancer and I needed people to drive me to treatments every day and many, many people from the well, um, including Phil Catt, who drove over from Berkeley to, to pick me up and drive me to a radiation treatment. And then, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of isolated and, and terrified, and um, being able to connect with people online was really important. Uh, also, I, I, I started a, a, a Tumblr about it, A, because I didn't want to uh, tell the same story to every person who asked me how I was doing, and... and um, B, because that had been my way of connecting with people, and it was a way to get out a lot of these feelings that, uh, you know, your oncologist doesn't want to talk to you about. Yeah. So, you know, that's the bright side of things, is that people who, who need to connect with someone because they're in trouble can find a lifeline. So, uh, I want to go back to the decorum thing and the c civility thing. Do you think that that, does, does that somehow cleanse itself over time? Or are there some elements of either rules or um, sort of social mores that actually start to define how we create community or connect in a civil way 
uh, amongst communities online? Well, my personal opinion about it is that a network of people who communicate online are not necessarily a community. And one of the things that signals the formation of community is that they begin to enforce norms. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of bad stuff going on online now. There was a lot of bad stuff going online um, all the time. Now there's just a lot more people online. And when I started writing the, the book, the thought that occurred to me that I thought about a lot was, what's the most important thing about this communication medium if, as we believe, a lot of people are going to be using it? And that brought me to the idea of the public sphere that political philosophers had been talking about that I didn't, had not known about until I asked. And it's the idea that democracy is not just about voting for your leaders. It's about having a population who are free enough to communicate and educated enough to have conversations that form public opinion. And that public opinion would influence policy. And there's a lot of bugs in that, particularly these days. And I'd have to say that my, the critical uncertainty was, will the public sphere be improved by people communicating online? Will democracy be improved? Will individuals have more freedom? And I have to say that I don't feel very optimistic or hopeful about that now. Um, but the difference between optimism and, and, and hopefulness is that hope is a choice. And so I think one of the things that everybody in this, this room can do is to think about how might we improve the the public sphere. I, I don't know that you can do it in a top-down way, and I do think that education has a great deal to do with it, and our schools, our educational institutions, certainly aren't meeting that challenge. So when I asked people to close their eyes, did, did you close your eyes? No. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't think so. So um, <laughs> when you think of community, do you, do you go straight to the digital side of it, or do you actually think of an IRL community, an in-real-life community as well? Well, you have to understand that I spent uh, most of my life as a writer, and um, a writer is in a room alone, which I, I think was why the, it became so attractive to me to be able to communicate with, with people online. So I'm probably not the, the, the best person to talk to about that, but... Uh, Dealing with my students who live immersed in this world, they have many more choices of the kinds of people that they can associate with and the kinds of communal discussions that they can participate in than, than I had or my generation had. So I, I think there's, a, there's a, a huge amount of freedom, but the, again, the uncertainty is who knows what to do about it. People stumble into places. It would be nicer if they could be more prepared. Got it. Any last thoughts, questions, comments? Well, the, the, the last uh, um, discussion about learning, I think, has a great deal to do with what some of the positive potential of life online is. Um, I started calling my, my classes co-learning communities, and I started calling my students, co-learners. And that sounds kind of superficial, but it really had a, an effect on them. And one thing that the, the, the media that we have now provide is educational opportunities that we've never had before. You, you, unless you were really a dedicated autodidact, you really had to go to school to learn things for thousands of years. But now I would say if, if you ask a 14-year-old how would you learn to play the ukulele or configure a web server? They would say, well, I go to YouTube and search on it. Don't read the comments, but there's a lot that you can... There's, <laughs> yeah, there's don't read the comments. I've there. learned that one. <laughs> um, you, if you learn how to not pay attention to the ugly stuff, there's a lot that we can learn together. And I think the one thing that's sort of lacking, Kevin was talking about learning about learning, how do we learn to, to, to be learners in community with all of these tools, with, with search and Wikipedia and, and YouTube and, and all of the 
social media for connecting with each other um, if we're not the teacher? What if a group of students wants to learn together? I think that we're going to see that develop. So I'll, I'll wrap up by just saying I, th I am my experience in moving from being a localized boutique hotelier with a bunch of hotels all in a region to becoming a hospita global hospitality uh, called the guru in the company around hospitality and community and to have that be in 192 countries taught me that it, it is definitely not a versus, it's, a, it's an and, it's not, you know, URL versus IRL. I, the, the opportunity for uh, the web and for the um, connection with others and the efficiency of how you can find the people who, you're, who can become your tribe is beautiful online. And then what it affords is the opportunity to create that community in person when you can. Again, if, if the person who you really relate to the most is in Iceland, you know, you may not see them all that often. Uh, but uh, I really have found on a personal level with this Airbnb community, the idea that you can actually create a sense of passion with people and then give yourself that opportunity to find the people locally that you can actually have the face-to-face -face in real life experience with. Um, because both of them, frankly, I think both of them speak to our humanity. Uh, the desire to actually discover people and the desire to, to deepen a connection with someone, which from at least from my perspective, happens more easily in person. I, I would just add one thing at the end that's advice for, for people online, which is I think one thing that would improve life online a great deal is that if a, a norm developed that it's okay to throw trolls out. That um, the, f <laughs> the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law, not um, let's let this jerk slap people around in my living room. And, and the, the, no, the number of people who will leave because they're offended by censorship is a fraction of the number of people who never, you never hear from because they don't want to stick their head up and have something thrown at it. On that happy note, um, <laughs> we're done. Thank you, Howard. Okay. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, Chip. Well, we've gone from do-it-yourself learning and com communities, both virtual and in reality. It wouldn't be a whole Earth event without thinking about the environment. There's no one better to bring up that discussion than Stephanie Mills. Stephanie? When Stephanie graduated from Mills College at a very young age, um, she became the leading spokeswoman for the environment. And in 1980, uh, went on to work at Coevolution as part of the staff team. Let me just get you. You're live, right here. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, gratitude to Mother Earth. Gratitude to Stuart and Ryan and their colleagues for realizing this event. Gratitude to Stephanie Feldstein for her partnership tonight. The image was taken this summer in a stand of old growth white pine saved in 1973 from the chainsaws by a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens. The plants are bunchberry and Canada mayflower. Gratitude to all those beings. Stewart, master of compressed utterance, asked for five minutes on the last and next half centuries. More than a tweet, less than a tome. <laughs> 50 years is an eye blink, yet despite many good faith efforts at every level to prevent waste and ruin, the growth of industrial civilization has ravaged the earth depleting soil, water, and biodiversity, contaminating the oceans and the atmosphere. In 1968, Paul and Ann Ehrlich dropped the population bomb. There were about 3.5 billion of us then, over 7 billion now. Contraceptive means improved, 
while political calculation, cultural conservatism, and patriarchy hampered their widespread adoption. 60s timblers of revolutionary change cracked a few foundations. In 1972, from the Club of Rome, we got a world systems model forecasting industrial civilization's inescapable limits to growth. In 1974, Congress heard of M. King Hubbard's curve mapping the limits to oil production, the end times for a petroleum-driven global infrastructure. Big business as usual has continued. Critical thresholds have been crossed. A late breaking discussion of degrowth is underway, but yet to reach a wide audience. A half century ago, we thought about living more responsibly. Access to tools enlivened possibilities of household, homestead, village, and neighborhood self-reliance. There was hope of stalling the apocalypse juggernaut. There still may be. While at Coevolution Quarterly, best magazine that ever lived, I also worked on the next Whole Earth Catalog. Its extensive reviews of essential means like hand tools and simple machines, how-to books for scores of timeless crafts, a spectrum of advice on farming and gardening, and astute reporting on appropriate technologies remain durable goods. Where I live, quite a few young hand makers, digital natives, cherish the catalog for its can-do spirit and for arraying the physical and conceptual tools they wield. They're flourishing while reducing their dependence on brittle systems and long lines of supply. What's coming? Possibilities I hope for, probabilities to dread. Possible, a renewed stirring of love for the earth. Respect for and reciprocity with all beings. Both love of place and interest in nature stem from our longtime past. Although these days they court struggle and grief along with authentic connection, they've got survival value. Belly botanists and bird nerds, fraud counters and foragers begin as kids. They're the ones who grow up to be the Rachel Carsons and E.O. Wilsons, the water protectors at Standing Rock. Maybe you've got such a one. Hope so. In the chaos of our moment, perhaps a new understanding is imminent. A fundamental change of heart is needed, and there are harbingers from the eco-pope to ecological restorationists everywhere. Animals of our kind are supposed to be uniquely moral actors. Now's the time to prove it. If our descendants are to inhabit a whole earth after this collision with ecological limits, we had best embrace virtues like Taoism's three treasures, frugality, fairness, and humility. We can polish up our capacities for neighborliness and mutual aid. We may be as gods, but we'll live best as plain members and citizens of our biotic communities. Thank you. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Stephanie Feldstein, who's the Population and Sustainability Director at the Center for Biodiversity. She leads the center's work to highlight and address threats to endangered species and wild places from runaway human population growth and overconsumption. She is the author of the marvelous Animal Lover's Guide to Changing the World. Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie, and, and thank you all. This has been a really inspiring evening so far. 
And I want to talk a little bit about technology and environmental protection, because I come from the back to the future generation. In just a few decades, we've made astonishing advances in technology. We can all sit here and watch Simone's amazing robotics videos on computers in our pockets that we can charge with the power of the sun. It's pretty incredible. It's things we've only dreamed of in science fiction. And it really feeds this sense that someday, maybe when we have hover cars, the world will be different. And throughout my life, there's always been this deification of technology, this belief that technology will save us all, whether it's from our own mortality or from the damage that we've done to the planet. But there is no high-tech silver bullet that can change the realities of nature, including that we're a part of it and that it has its limits. Technology has been amazing things, of course, and I enjoy being part of the age of information and all that brings. And there's a long list of advances like solar energy and water purification and so many more that are a key part of mitigating the decades of environmental exploitation behind us. But technology alone isn't going to be our savior. It doesn't let us off the hook. And it's a tool and not even the most important one. We don't need to wait for technology to save us nor can we afford to do so. In 1970, Norman Borlaug, the man whose technology transformed agriculture, dedicated his Nobel speech to the topic of how the Green Revolution was never really going to free humanity from hunger until the people who worked to increase food production started talking with those working to decrease population growth. Because the real issue isn't that we lack the tools to solve the biggest problems that are driving the wildlife extinction crisis, polluting the environment, and putting our own species at risk. We have the tools. I mean, renewable energy technology has come so far that we can meet our needs without fossil fuels. We know that diets that are more reliant on plant-based foods than animal-based foods can cut the devastating impact of agriculture on our land, climate, and water. And we know that universal access to reproductive health care, education, and equality can reverse population growth. Of course, there is still room for progress in making these solutions more effective, efficient, and safer than they are today, but we don't suffer from a lack of tools. We suffer from a lack of language. We don't have the social discourse needed to increase access to these tools, to end overconsumption, to realize the limits of our planet, to realize the cultural shift that's needed for gender equity, for agriculture that supports all life, and an energy transition that's not only renewable, but just. And we also need to overcome the barriers of communication and privilege that are restricting the access to those tools. So in addition to those working on hunger and population, I'd also invite to Borlaug's table those who are fighting for justice and against poverty, and those working for a future where all species, including our own, can thrive on this planet. Because if there's one thing we learned this past week from that report that came out from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it's that we're all going to need to work together if we want to avoid disaster. But it's been nearly 50 years since Borlaug's speech, and even now, many of our movements are barely on speaking terms. So if we're going to make it to the next 50 years, we need the language to understand each other across issues, to mobilize people, to influence policymakers and the business community. We need to think outside the capitalism box. We need to think beyond partisan politics. We need to acknowledge and accept the limits to growth and prioritize the tools that already exist. We have tools, including laws like the, to protect nature, like the Endangered Species Act, laws that could exist to save our remaining wild places and create a healthier, more just world. And of all the tools that we're underutilizing in protecting the planet, the most egregious one is half of the world's population. Women are still oppressed and harassed and kept out of government and boardrooms. Now, I don't want to discount the progress that's been made socially or technologically. If I wasn't full of hope, I wouldn't be able to do this work every day. We are starting to recognize how interconnected these issues are, but instead of fully using the tools that are already available to us, in many ways, we're still waiting for that hover car era to begin. So whether we're working on the details of policy or developing new tools or trying to crack the code of better communicating how to use those tools or the urgency and solvability of the problems we face, it doesn't start with technology. If we want, to, if we want a world 50 years from now that's better than it was 50 years ago, 
We must embrace the solutions that are in front of us and have been for years, starting with equality, dignity, dignity and respect for nature and for each other. It sounds like there's some friends of the earth out there. <laughs> well, I want to start with talking about it. You have this lovely photo behind us, and you talked about this quite a bit. I'd love to hear your, more from you on how a sense of place influences the future of the environment and our resilience. Well, I think... Um, it's attachment, it's a, it's a primary attachment to place with distinct character. Like I, I live in the former North Woods, it's a, it's a forested region. This was taken up in the upper peninsula of Michigan, a little north. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, that's the way you say that's goddess country. Um, I, th I think, you, you know, you can't, it's hard to fight for what you don't know, you know? It's hard to fight for what you're not uh, connected with, what you don't have a, a sense of. And um, so a connection to a real geographical location with its own character, its own spatial dimensions, its own um, watersheds, its own plant life, uh, even if it's, if it's that tough, weedy, committed plant life that grows up in the cracks between the concrete. I think that it, we need, I need, we need, my cohort need, that kind of passion and, and attachment and physical connection. And also, um, to resist just the homogenization of the planet, the, the stripping out of biodiversity, which you and your colleagues are working against so uh, cannily, and um, just the reduction of everything to a kind of a, a, a slag of um, uh, the Anthropocene slag. So sense of place, biodiversity, diversity of places, and uh, commitment to sort of envisioning the uh, life systems, the biota, the new forms of uh, community, biotic community, they're gonna perforce emerge in this era. I think it's critical. I love that term, Anthropocene slag. I mean, it's terrible, but it, it's such an apt description for so much of the destruction that we see. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, um, it's... It, it, a love of the earth, and any love, exposes you to the risk of sorrow as, as well as joy. And to behold what's going on uh, on the planet in terms of, of the extinction crisis, um, just, you know, it will tear your heart out day after day after day. Um, yet, What's so uh, remarkable is the long-term, long-haul commitment that people have to protecting the wild, to protecting wild lands, or to regenerating. I, I've been with bioregionalist friends here in San Francisco for the last several days, and learned about projects here of native plant nurseries out at Hunter's Point you know, with kids from that part of the city bringing back uh, wildness to, characteristic wildness, particular wildness to this area. So it's indomitable as nature itself and, and direct connection with that indomitability really infuses one with, you know, renewed love of the earth. Yeah, I think that love piece is so important in, you know, in our, our ability to keep on doing this work. It's, 
it's interesting, one thing that we do at the Center for Biological Diversity is, so every year, all the staff gets together for a staff retreat where everybody gets to, you know, see each other in person because we're scattered around the country, um, you know, learn about work, have all those important cross-program conversations, all of those wonderful strategic things, but also, a feature of it has become the segment that we do where different people from staff get up and talk about what they love. And this is something that started a few years ago and it's just become a really meaningful part of our time together because people can get up and talk about anything. It might be the species they're working on or it might be their children who they're doing this work for. And I think that really helps us connect because sometimes we take for granted that those of us doing this work professionally day in and day out are passionate about it but you know, we, when we dig deeper from that, there really is that, that deep love for very specific things that we're fighting for. Yes, what uh, would you say, you're, what, what uh, being are you uh, inspired to, to your work by? Well, I think my book kind of gives it away that I'm a lifelong animal lover. And, and it's kind of been an interesting progression for me because you know I was that little kid who loved all animals, but I didn't grow out of it, I really grew into it. And as I learned more about different species, I was like, I love all of them, like don't make me pick one. Uh -huh. and, and then as I learned that, I realized that, well, if I love animals, I have to love the places that they need to live to. I have to love wilderness, I have to want to protect wilderness. And one of the things that's been interesting to me as I grew older is that that also extended to, to realizing that, you know, we're a part of this world too. And that compassion toward humans and, and understanding where other people are coming from, as well as really thinking through what are some of these issues of equality and poverty and social injustices that we're seeing around the world, that's all tied into the fate of our planet and the fate of other animals as well. And so it's really kind of expanded you know, my, my compassion and my drive to do this work. Yes, there's no reason to assume a, a, a limit to compassion. Um, I'm struck by the inclusiveness of uh, more youthful and contemporary activism, that you, you, you are part of a synthesis now that's linking all of those, all of those concerns. Um, this is a jump, but I don't want to neglect to talk about this. Um, in addition to being the author of a full-fledged book, uh, Stephanie is the author of some very interesting poetry, <laughs> which appears on the Center for Biological Diversity's Endangered Species Condoms packages. And I wonder if, if you'd be willing to talk a little bit about that campaign, which is so brilliant, because it brings, brings population and, and endangered species protection together. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and brings together that poetry degree that my parents were sure was going to be useless. <laughs> Little did they know it would wind up with things like packages of condoms with artwork of endangered species and sayings on it like, for the sake of the horned lizard, slow down, love wizard. <laughs> <laughs> So they're clearly a very fun project to work on. Um, but, you know, they're also a really important project because, as many people have noticed over the past few decades, talking about human population has fallen out of favor in the environmental movement. But obviously it's still such a critical part. It's an underlying driver of all of the worst environmental problems that, that we're facing today. But a lot of people for many reasons don't wanna talk about population. It feels personal, there's an ugly history to it. There are a lot of different reasons. So we wanted to find creative ways to reach out to people. And when you hand somebody a condom with a picture of a polar bear that says, wrap with care, save the polar bear, it's an <laughs> entirely different way to start the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> And a really effective one. And that gets back to, you know, what I was talking about earlier with communication, is that we need to figure out what are the best tools of communication today. And that changes, as we've heard from you know, our other speakers throughout this evening, that that's not a static thing, is over time, the types of messages that resonate with people, the ways that you reach people change. And the endangered species condoms are just a great project to be able to bring this conversation that's become really taboo back to the forefront and in a way that's really accessible for people. 
It's a wonderful, wonderful campaign. One of my favorites was um, Cover Your Tweedle, Save the Burying Beetle. <laughs> the classic. <laughs> Uh, in thinking about conversations and scale, you know, and, and um, resolving some of these terribly contentious issues, um, I, I live in a smallish community and I wind up going to township meetings and face-to-face -face having... Uh, disagreements about land use and um, just how we see living in a particular place. And so um, I wonder, you know, it's like maybe the reason we bank so heavily on technology to save us is that well-meaning attempts at social change often go astray. So, you know, how important do you think are factors like scale and locale in making the shifts to equity, justice, and more sustainable provision? I think the other thing about social justice is that it's hard and it's a long process and that can get really frustrating because these are problems that we want solved yesterday. And the, what technology promises is a shortcut, but the thing that we need to be aware of is that shortcut getting us where we wanna go. You know, when you look at things, like if you think about where we started with Norman Burlag's technological advances and what that promised for higher agricultural yields, that was at a time where you fast forward to now, and I don't think he was envisioning a world with twice as many people where we still have massive you know, numbers of people who are going hungry every day, and the middle of this country has been turned over to GMO monocrops. So that didn't really get us where we want it to go. And, and when you look at agriculture, it's a great example to get to the point about scale and locale, is that, you know, if we were thinking about agriculture in, you know, in more of a localized and diversified way, we wouldn't have this GE monocrop problem, if that's where we were going into valuing it. And I think the other thing, you know, another metaphor for this is if you think about technology as being a hammer, it's great if you have a nail, but not everything is a nail. And I think we really need to respect the, the cultural and ecological diversity of different places and different communities and not strive to create one solution that's going to work everywhere, but really to look at how do we make change at the local level and how do we create these models that can be adapted as needed to different communities. Yes, yes. Relocalize to where? You know, I, I um, am very interested in the transition movement, um, transition towns movement, because um, a great many folks anticipate a world where there's a lot less traveling and transport and a lot more local self-reliance, uh, local... Uh, production for local needs, and also um, a regaining of, a, of the ability to discern between wants and needs, and to address uh, meeting basic needs locally. So um, enhancing life in those locales includes regenerating the surroundings, the natural surroundings. Absolutely, and I think that one of the other things that we get from local communities is these more integrated solutions. I know that you live in a community with a lot of makers, and you know we've talked a little bit that in villages around the world, they're finding solutions that are trying to address healthcare, as well as local economic issues and environmental sustainability altogether. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on how that plays into this bigger picture. Well, I, it... Uh it harks to bioregionalism, which for decades has been saying we need to regenerate local cultures and, and to reclaim some of the longtime human endowment for uh, health care, natural provision, and um, tutorial relationships with other beings. So... Um, we uh, sort of shorted out there for a second. Are you hopeful that that reclamation is happening? 
Yes, yeah, I do, I do. I think that, that it, you know, common ground can be literally common ground. You know, the, the land under our feet and the, uh, for, in my case, the forest that, that we love um, and learning how to sort of use it and inhabit it on a long-term basis. I mean, another hot-button hot issue, hard to talk about, is carrying capacity, and uh, which is something that needs to, to be raised in all our discussions of how we inhabit life places. Yeah, absolutely. That's the one thing with technology is we've tried to cheat carrying capacity, but in the end, as we're finding out every day now, it's not a thing that we'll succeed at. Alas. <laughs> and on that Time's note, up. thank you all. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> so 30 some years ago, I answered an ad that read, I'm looking for someone to uh, work on computers, travel, and meet interesting people. <laughs> and I'm happy to say 30 years later, I'm still meeting interesting people. Thank you, Stuart. Come on up. Thank you, Danica. Let's see. Ah, I actually have slides. Um, there's a kind of a reframing, I hope, going on today in relation to Whole Earth. And um, it's getting over the sense that somehow this is, the Whole Earth is Stuart Brand. Um, and I'm, you know, sort of the founder and editor of the Whole Earth Catalog, blah, blah, blah. And I will say some things about what people come to and, and talk about. But everything since the Whole Earth Catalog, I've co-founded. And I noticed as I look back more carefully at the original Whole Earth Catalog, it was co-founded, especially with Dick Raymond, who died a couple of years ago, who ran what John Markoff calls a, a nonprofit incubator, one of the earliest incubators in Silicon Valley. Uh, the sign over his desk said, Fail Young. I did a fair amount of that working with him. And then happened to have a success. And I realized he really, really was a co-founder of Whole Earth Catalog. And if you look at me in context of the reality of what it takes uh, to put out, in this case, uh, the Whole Earth Epilogue in 1974, and that's just half the people that worked on it. There's some of the rest of the half, and many of these folks are in the other room, and I hope you meet them later. Uh, and even the, the earliest Whole Earth catalog that we did in a garage up on Skyline Boulevard was a lot of people. And then down in the Whole Earth truck store, there was a lot of people. Originally, the Whole Earth catalog was a subscription operation. And if you notice the lady on the left with the braids there, you see her again with the braids in the foreground here, handsome lady with dark hair. Uh, that's Lois Britton. Her name then was Lois Brand. And effectively, she was a co-founder of the Whole Earth Catalog. Uh, there she is doing the books. I was talking to her, she's here. I was talking to her earlier today, and we, we were trying to remember, how long was it before we decided to pay ourselves? And uh, she said, well, it was about a year before either of us got paid. We, uh, you got uh, paid for more hours than I did. And she said, I said, how do you know that? Well, she said, I wrote the checks. <laughs> And she is very much a co-founder of that operation. Uh, you go on later with Coevolution Quarterly. Uh, people like Stephanie Mills were in the thick of making a, a complex publication with many editors, domain editors, staff editors, line editors, and so on. And in this photograph in the lower left, there's a lady who was then named Patty Phelan, who later became Ryan Phelan at the age of 44 when she got tired of having a diminutive female name and <laughs> went to her middle name, Ryan. And on it goes. Uh, we saw a bit of the Hackers Conference, and this was a hundred or so amazing young people who were uh, reinventing the world and, and got away with it. Likewise, at the well, I was trying to look for, you know, what's a really good photograph of everybody on the well? 
And there you have John Coat and Cliff Figala with leadership on the left. Gail Williams should be there. And the photograph on the right is actually everybody on the well. <laughs> <laughs> That's the servers where we all lived in our uh, virtual reality with our imaginary friends. So how did it actually work in the catalog? What actually happened there with people? And I've had occasion to look at this just in context of what people have come to say. And a lot of it had to do with just the quality of stuff that we found. And so still the best book on learning how to draw is The Natural Way to Draw by Nicolaides. Uh, still the best book on learning how to fly is Languish's Stick and Rudder. We were able to find these things. It was tough keeping them in print. Sometimes we helped keep them in print. There was basic stuff on, uh, like from Helen Scott and Earring, on how to grow a sugar bush, a bunch of maple trees, and then get the maple syrup out of them and make that. At the same time, uh, how do you grow wine and make good wine out of what you grow? And viticulture. Early on, this is before videos took over everything, there was still the possibility of learning in detail how to make uh, really good television productions or film productions. And you could go dead at that. And people started doing things like that. One of the best of all publications that came out at that time from the <laughs> Boston Women's Collective, Our Bodies, Ourselves, was a revolutionary publication. Up to that point, Having a woman's body was basically treated as a disease by medicine. And uh, what the women, many of them doctors, realized was actually having a woman's body is, uh, one, a miracle, two, an amazing instrument that uh, wants tuning. And they worked out all the details of doing that. And it wound up being one of the real founders of the women's movement, I think, to take that kind of control over the tool of one's own body. So time goes by, catalogs go by, coevolution goes by, and by and by people start coming up. Oh, you're Stuart Brand. You know, I still have the first whole earth catalog. And I quickly learned that, you know, I started, wow, you do? Very few of those exist, you know. <laughs> I only have one. And, uh, and then they would describe it, and I realized they were talking about their first whole earth catalog. But why did they keep it? I would ask them, why? that's interesting, why do you keep it? And mumble, mumble. But then they would go on and say, well, you know, that catalog is what got me the hell out of Indiana <laughs> or Arizona or North, New, Northern Dakota, maybe. And what it was was, a, for them, a, a window on a world that their small community was not giving them at the time. Or they would say things, you know, it's really what got me started with making guitars. It's what really got me started with music. And, and uh, it, that's been my profession ever since. I remember, you know, I guess the whole catalog really set my life in the direction it went. Well, you know, they're thanking me. I feel like I should be thanking them. Because there is this gratitude that goes on. And what is the gratitude actually about is, is what I've been asking myself. I think it's about people getting not just permission to do stuff, to try stuff, to take over their own life, carry on, get up the hell out of Indiana, or do things. It was an encouragement to do that, just because here's, as was mentioned earlier by Kevin, all these tools, and you get a sense of, my God, there's lots of different doors. And I can peek through a bunch of them, and some I might just kick open and go try it and see if it actually connects with the world or connects for me. Eh, that one didn't work, but that one does. And, that one, and then it lead to these other things. And so when Steve Jobs said it was the Google book 35 years before Google, it was sort of the internet before then in the sense of that there's this array of possibilities that open out in front of you and that invite you into them. And so I regard this as, as a form of, of conferring agency. Agency is freedom and independence. It's a sense of, I can do stuff. I can do basically whatever really interests me. And the whole Earth Catalog was focused on the freedom of the individual. What's the opposite of agency? The opposite of agency is basically victimhood. 
And one of the things I remember writing somewhere along the way in one of the Whole Earth catalogs is, you know, what's worth doing? Unmake victims. Start with yourself. Branch out from there. I think agency is one of the most fundamental things that we can take on in ourselves and encourage in others. <clears throat> and that's <clears throat> one of the reasons I especially wanted to have my version of uh, YouTube to come on shortly, because when people ask me now, where's the kind of thing of conferring uh, skills and tools, where do you get that now? I, you get it from YouTube. And we heard that in, in Kevin and Simone's session. Simone has proved that uh, we are as gods and might as well get bad at it. <laughs> um, I just wanted to let everyone know that those fireworks are going off out there in celebration of this party. No, <laughs> fucking, yeah. What? I think she made that up. <laughs> There's a whole other level of uh, YouTube videos, not just how to weld, but how to do amazing things. And for that, I want to bring up uh, Sal Khan. Thanks, Stuart. Really, really honored to be here. Uh, well, you know, I, I just want to give, a, for those of y'all who aren't familiar, a little bit what we're up to. It, and, and it's really an honor to kind of connect it because it was inspired by all of what we're celebrating today for, for the past 50 years. Uh, but for those of who don't know about Khan Academy, uh, we're a nonprofit with a mission of providing a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. Uh, and for the most part, it exists on, on the internet, uh, but it has a whole life of volunteers, uh, hundreds of thousands of people contributing to it, volunteering their time, et cetera, et cetera. And to get a flavor for it, uh, here's a montage of at least what some of the videos look like, but it's much more than that. It's practice, it's feedback, it's, it's assessment, and whatever else. Sound? I could narrate it, I guess. I'm told the humidity makes it feel hotter. Why is this? Excellent question, LeBron. And you can just see the pleasure he had. The right to privacy as such is not spelled out in the Constitution. Of course, the word liberty is. Two things actually can interbreed, although for these two in particular, it seems like the mechanics would get kind of difficult. And I can keep playing around with these numbers and see what kind of colors I can come up with. If this does not blow your mind, then you have no emotion. Thought y'all would appreciate Euler's identity. Uh, as, as, I, as I mentioned, it's much more, there's uh, you know, millions of, of learners of all ages, I was about to say kids, but we have people you know, 80, 90 years old who are coming here to, to learn things out of interest or, or to help out their family uh, across subjects and grades. Uh, this right over here is, is just a, a story of kind of the, the type of potential we're, we're hoping to unlock on the planet. Um, about six, seven years ago, uh, the Taliban take over a town in Afghanistan, and uh, they forbid all the young girls from going to school. Uh, this young girl, Sultana, was one of them. She was 12 years old at the time. She doesn't go to school anymore, threatened with things like acid burnings. And so uh, she was lucky enough to have a family that had a computer. So it, she did something like 10 hours of chores a day. But then every waking hour, she would get on the computer and try to learn. First, she tried to teach herself English. And then once she uh, learned English, uh, she got a, a relative to get her a, any reading material she could get in English. And uh, she had a Time magazine, and she found out about Khan Academy from that. And then from there, she just went from a, a second or third grade level where, where she was at, uh, got her algebra, her physics, her chemistry, her uh, biology, and she decides that she wants to be a physicist. And then she just keeps going. She starts leveraging the other resources, things like the, the MOOCs that are out there, and, convince, and, and wants to come to the US. She smuggles herself into Pakistan to take the SAT because it's not administered in, in Afghanistan. Does shockingly well, uh, and that's when, when I, someone introduced, hey, we have to help her get to the US. Uh, I, I tried forwarding it around. Well, luckily, Nicholas Kristof from the New York Times also found out about Sultana, and he wrote this op-ed. And what's incredible, and just shows you the type of potential that, that's starting to get unlocked in the world, is that after this, Sultana got political asylum and is now doing physics research with, one of the, with a Nobel Prize winning physicist at MIT. And so you can imagine that the let's see, does this, does that real quick? Okay, here. 
So you can imagine that, uh, you know, uh, it, this, this could be happening all over the planet, and it is on, on some level. Uh, these are all pictures of, of the resources being used everywhere. And, and this was work done by other NGOs, volunteers. Uh, probably the most exciting one, really in the same vein as Sultana's story, is the one on the top right. Uh, this was about three years ago. I got this, these, these photographs, and, and I got this letter from the young woman on the top right. Her name is Zaya. And then she said that... Um, uh, she really enjoyed the, 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 the resources, and I immediately assumed that she was middle class. Her, she, her, her, uh, she actually sent a video testimonial. Her English was quite good. Uh, she clearly had access to the internet. But then when I read the, the email more closely, it turns out that there was a group of engineers from Silicon Valley who were using all of their vacation time to go to Mongolia and set up computer labs with internet and orphanages. And what you see there, those are the orphan girls in Mongolia using, using Khan Academy, and, and Zaya was one of those orphans. And what makes this story neat, kind of like Sultana's story, is that Zaya has now graduated from high school and is now the number one contributor to Khan Academy in the Mongolian language. And, and so just to give you a sense of, of what at least the, the video part feels like in other languages, I'll, I'll show you this. Me comí dos cuartos de pizza. L'hypoténuse commune, ok. Si, je sais. so interesting and funny, make more lessons. I watch that when I get lazy. Uh, so th this is kind of the, the start of what we're trying to do and, and really just with, with all of the thousands of stakeholders now, Khan Academy is, is clearly much, much more than, than just me. Um, uh, really in the same spirit of the whole Earth Catalog, uh, empower every person on the planet and, and try to make education really a, like clean drinking water or, or basic shelter and, and just a, a human right. And so with that, I'd love to... That was great. Oh, yeah. The whole Earth Catalog is so obsolete. Every respect, I just love what we're you know seeing tonight is how much that's the case. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about how this whole thing started for you. You've been in finance in New York and all that kind of thing, and and, and how did it start? Yeah, yeah and, and some folks might might know the the backstory, but it, it uh, my original background was was in technology, uh, but then. Uh, I ended up working as an analyst at a hedge fund, okay. uh, and then I had just gotten married. My family was visiting me up in Boston, where, where I was working, uh, and uh, it just came out of conversation that my 12-year-old cousin who was visiting, Nadia, was, was having trouble in math. Because of that, she was being placed into a slower track, so I offered to tutor her, tutor her remotely when she went back to New Orleans. And so I started working with her. Long story short, she, she kind of got learned, finally learned unit conversion, which was holding her back. So wait a minute. How heavy a mathematician were you at this point? How what? How, how heavy a mathematician were you? Oh, I was pretty intense. In fact, that's part, selfishly part of the motivation was, uh, you know, most of us in our day jobs don't get to go really deep into the academic stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it was almost, I, I liked visit, revisiting all of, all of that. But I was, yeah, I was, I was a pretty big math nerd in, in high school and college. And yet yeah. you're teaching this kid really, really fundamental, what, geometry? What were you guys doing, algebra? Well, it, it started with Nadia, and this was, yeah, this is pre-algebra, unit, mm -hmm. number, very basic stuff. You know, one thing led to another, and, and Nadia started to really accelerate. Then I started to work with her younger brothers, and word gets around the family that free tutoring is going on. <laughs> and uh, before I know it, it's 10 to 15 cousins, family, friends, every day after work. And I would just, you know, my wife's here. She'd know. I would just, like, come home. And I was like, oh, I got, I got, I got a calls to do. Um, and, and, and it was really a... And, I, and the first Khan Academy was, I, I started with the software. I was like, oh, my cousins all need more practice. And I saw that they had gaps in their knowledge. And I was showing this off at a dinner party in, in San Mateo, and the host of the party, I give him credit, Zulfikar Ramzan, he said, um, you know, this is all cool, Sal, but how are you scaling up your lessons? Mm. And I said, oh, it's, it's, I'm not. And he said, well, why don't you record them as videos and, and put them up on YouTube? I immediately thought that was a 
horrible idea. I said, you know, YouTube's for cats playing piano. It's not for <laughs> serious, serious mathematics. And, uh, ca and you know, the cats do not learn from other cats playing piano. I'm apparently they do. <laughs> apparently it has to start somewhere. Um, but yeah, and, 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 and those, that first content I put out there, I would tell my cousins, like, hey, this is there for you. Watch it ahead of time. That way we can get on the phone. We can dig deeper. And uh, they, they, they somewhat backhandedly told me after a couple of months that they liked me better on YouTube than in person. <laughs> and uh, I took it as positive feedback, and I kept going. And uh, you know, soon people who weren't my cousins were watching. And it, you know, very similar story to, to what we heard earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of took on a life of its own. And um, around 2000. Nine, I couldn't focus on my day job anymore, and we mm -hmm. set it up as a nonprofit, and here we are. So teaching math is a little different than teaching welding. I think it's you, you, it's not so much a, a show and then do a like. There's a lot of sequential stuff you have to get before you get the next stuff. And how does that play out? The, the, how do you make that actually go forward? I, I think yes and no. I think that's probably part of the problem of of how traditional education handles math or frankly science is that mm -hmm. they kind of teach it as a series of things to know or as a series of steps and for sure it is that mm -hmm. but it is there's a certain art to it and there's a certain and I think there was it was it was luck frankly that that, that first content I was making it for my family and so I was very you know we've been talking about uh, being open to just showing mistakes mm -hmm. so there's there's a certain charm I guess of some of the the early and even now where I would actually try to solve the things in real time. They weren't planned. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you'd see me go down a path and say, oh, wait, wait, that's not exactly right. Or I made a little error. And I get all sorts of letters from people. Now some people who are you know, adults saying, that was the first time that I, my anxiety went away because <gasps> I realized that it's okay to make, like, because when you go to class, it's just, everyone, the, you know, the teacher does it like it's obvious that you just would immediately do those steps where it's not. Even someone who knows what, you know, you kind of stumble around a little bit, make a careless mistake, but then you fix it, you laugh at yourself. Uh -huh. um, so I think it, you know, I think there, like welding or almost anything, there's a, there's a art to it. There's a little bit of a, hey, you know, when this doesn't work, try this type of thing. So... Uh, you know, one of the inversions that occurred that is, I think, quite profound is you went to class to see lectures, and uh, and then you went home and did homework, and all by yourself or maybe with a sibling or something if you were lucky. Uh, and what you did is basically arrange it so that the kids go home and see your lectures, and then they come back to class and and. How does that work? What do they do back in class? Yeah, yeah. And th this wasn't my idea. This is um, teachers started emailing me and saying, "Hey, you know, that was a really good, you know, or a respectable thing explanation of photosynthesis, and now the kids can get practice." So I don't use my valuable class time for that anymore. For just information dissemination, right. I could use that for more human interactions. And that's when a light bulb kind of went on in my head. It's like, gee, this could you could rethink everything. You don't have to have kids all tracked. Uh, and, you know, by similar age or similar perceived ability. Uh, you don't have to have every kid work in lockstep. It started to dawn on, on many of us that, and, you know, the Benjamin Bloom wrote tons about mastery learning, but it was just never practical for everyone to learn at their own time and pace. But now it was. Now mm -hmm. the tools are there, not just Khan Academy, but the MOOCs, all, everything on YouTube. Um, and so it was really learning from the educators telling, and, and this has always been happening in humanities seminars. In humanities seminars, the teacher doesn't read to you. They they ask you to do the work ahead of time so you, we can be humans mm -hmm. when we come to the classroom. But um, strangely, in a lot of STEM-type subjects, it wasn't, it wasn't the case. So you started out in STEM, but then you moved in the direction. I took, uh, I took the uh, thing in the French Revolution. I was reading a novel about the French Revolution. I go, oh, well, let's see what these guys are doing on that. And it was a neat little half-hour thing that you did. Well, yeah, no, and that's part, part of the selfish motivation for me is I get, as part of my job, uh, is I get to dig deep into things that when you learn it the first time in school, you're under pressure, you don't have to, and I'm like, I want to learn about the French Revolution, and now I can have a, a medium to say, oh, that is cool, and I can uh, show that, and, and hopefully there's some you know, people like that because it's not coming from someone who just, you know, has known this stuff for 30 years at like mm -hmm. the back of their hand. It's someone who's discovering and we kind of uh, discover, discover things together. You know, one of the things that was is sort of a um, surprise for me in education, so I prep school and Stanford and undergraduate and all of that, and then I was going to be, I was supposed to go on to graduate school in biology because I did okay in biology. And then... Uh, but I'd been at ROTC, so there was going to be active duty as an Army officer. 
And I could have cut that short and done ahead with some kind of doc and postdoc and all that stuff, but I really didn't want to. And so I did two years in the Army active duty where I learned about training. And training blew my mind. It was this you know, total equality of outcome situation where you will jump out of an airplane five times at the end of this airborne <laughs> training course. Uh, whether you like it or not, whether you do the homework or not, that's what's going to happen. And uh, <laughs> you know, that, that, that insistence on outcome and then just the forcing of it. And I saw the quality of teaching, often by black sergeants, of uh, just things like how to down, you know, how to do a parachute landing fall and things like that, was just outstanding. It was, it was, they'd done it a million times, and you could say, well, they're really tired of it. No, they're really good at it. And, and the, the training just knocked me out. It, it, it was the most important thing, many important things I think I learned in the military is that that kind of focus on just getting it right is an amazing thing to impart. Is that part of what is going on with your courses, do you think? Yeah, you know, the, the central thesis is, right now we're, we're living in a world, if, if I ask any of us, you know, what percentage of the population you think is capable of contributing to cancer research or start starting the next Google or, or um, you know, writing the next novel, most of us will say, oh, well, today it's 1% maybe, maybe with the great education system it's 5%, hmm. but I think that's because we have some blinders on, on what's possible. Uh, it's based on our experiences where we would go through the system, Work, working in lockstep, we're all accumulating these little Swiss cheese gaps because we're all being pushed along at the same rate. Mm -hmm. And at some point, we see a lot of kids hit a wall in algebra class, uh, not because they're not bright, not mm -hmm. because algebra is difficult, it's because they got, had some gaps in unit conversion. or Calculus was my wall. I'll calculus is the wall, and it's yeah. usually gaps in algebra, and it, you mm -hmm. don't even know it, or physics, oh. and it's gaps in calculus. Uh, and we are seeing more and more uh, that if these kids can fill in these gaps, that's what's keeping... So it's really, it's a, you know, I, I'm starting to get more and more convinced it's not just 5% or 10% who can do these kind of be members of the creative class, so to mm -hmm. speak, but I think it'll be 40 or 50 or, or 60 or maybe 100%. And it's almost an imperative that it does get to that world because, you know, we see what's happening with automation and, and the need for physical mm -hmm. labor as much in a lot of industries or even information processing. Uh, and, you know, I kind of imagine we need to go to the Star Trek reality where uh, everyone is a explorer, a researcher, uh, a scientist, an artist of, of, of some kind. How soon, please? Yeah, I, I, you know, it's, 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 it's happening faster than I would have predicted. And, and you know, that kind of leads to a, a question for you. You know, would the steward, what would the steward of 1968 be thinking if, of, of the world today? What, what is beyond uh, 1968 steward's expectations and what is a disappointment for 1968 steward? Uh, disappointed we don't have space colonies yet. Uh, Jeff Bezos is working on that one. It's, I'm glad to see it. Um, surprise and delight that the population, which had been a, a major issue at that point because it was so steep, is leveling off and leveling off pretty quickly. Thanks mainly to basically our bodies ourselves. Thanks mainly to women really getting control of uh, the re reproductive capabilities and, and also taking on things like writing poetry on condom packages. Uh, how can you resist that? Uh, I would be grieved at finding out how many populations of wild species are uh, in trouble. They're not going extinct all that rapidly, at least not on continents or in the ocean, but they are on, on islands. But just that the, the um, especially the megafauna keep going down and my special personal project is to try to bring, help bring all the megafauna back so that the whole world looks like it used to look like, which is it looked like Africa. There was all these big creatures going around. And we've had some successes. So the, um, it looked like the, the California mountain lion, the cougars were gonna be gone. They were bounty hunted and uh, they were headed out. They're totally back now. And uh, they hardly kill people at all, unexpectedly. <laughs> They're not vengeful. Um, they're just careful, and maybe because they were hunted for a long time. So these, you know, there's a negotiation going on with nature that we need a lot more STEM knowledge to really carry through, I think. Um, but that negotiation is taking longer than I expected, 
and uh, taking on a climate with the level of seriousness that it needs to be addressed has taken much longer than I expected. But in 68, hey, remember, I was, you know, 29 year old, I didn't know squat. Uh, and one of the reasons I did the whole Earth Catalog is to maybe the way you sort of uh, did some of these courses to learn about them was to, you know, I was saying I'm going to help the people doing communes figure out how to do all these basics they care about. Uh, they didn't know how refrigerators work. They thought you could grow a garden by just sticking a stick in the ground and throwing seeds at it. Uh, and got over that in one season and then either gave up or they actually learned how to do it. Well, I was one of those people who wanted to learn all that stuff. And so the access to tools and skills was my own desire to, to learn those things. Um, but, you know, 29 year olds uh, have a intense, short, view of the world. And one of the great things about us getting more older people around, and you'll uh, discover this as you get older, is your um, range of not only personal experience expands, but your sense of participation in history expands forward and back. And the more back, the more forward in a way. And then you start to get comfortable in the long story. And that's uh, sort of what I impart these days. Does that make sense? Uh, no, absolutely. And wh what do you think if, uh, I'll focus more on 1968 Stewart, if 1968 Stewart were transported today, if, if, if he, was he or she were sitting in the audience right now, what do you think they would be focus focusing their energy on to, to, for the whole earth? Well, if I was any good I'd, and I was still interested in biology, I'd be probably looking at microbial ecology. And uh, Edward O. Wilson gave that answer in his wonderful book, Naturalist, about his history as a scientist. It's one of the best sort of personal biographies of a scientist. Um, and why is that? Do you see there as kind of a, a way to feed the planet that way, a way to energies? What, what is the... Microbial ecology is most of life on Earth <laughs> and in our own bodies, for that matter. And it has been, it was a black box when I was a biologist in the 50s. Um, you know, the soil was a black box. And basically everything that was very small was a black box. They were just starting to learn about DNA at that point. But now these things are becoming transparent. And, and um, you know, with metagenomics, with the ability to, to uh, sample any body of water and find out not only who's alive in it, but who, everybody who lives upstream and things like this. And then uh, get a sense of the genetic variability in any, any given species population. I was studying population biology, but we were doing it with you know, less than one eye compared to what you really need to know. So the lore density is coming on and I think we're uh, still catching up with that density, which is an interesting situation for us, I think. And I see that we're getting right up to 9 o'clock. Do we have a last word or two you'd like to impart? No, you know, I, I just think uh, the, 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 leg, the tradition that you started or, or part of, I think it's only going to accelerate. And um, there's a lot of things to be a little bit uh, wary of in the world today. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think net-net, uh, there's just a lot of things that folks that are in front of us, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, YouTube is in front of but how big of a deal it's going to be. And I think we are, over the next 20 or 30 years, not just education being available, but this idea of unlocking this potential, which is going to ex accelerate everything, hopefully, in a positive way. What about yourself? You're here. Let's accelerate in a positive way. Let's get all the speakers back up here. <laughs> Take a big old bow. <laughs> Special thanks to Ryan Phelan and Danica Remy, who created and organized this thing and all the stuff that you're going to see shortly. Thanks to the speakers. Thanks to you, the audience. And thanks to the many in the audience and in the next room, and who are not able to be here, who made 30 plus years of whole earthness happened. Thank you to all of them and thank you to you.
And I just yeah. want to remind everyone that this evening was really made possible by um, a lot of very generous sponsors who helped make the alumni come together to make this program come together. Um, Wired Long Now has been an incredible support. Um, Ken and Maddie Dykewald, Juan and Mary Enriquez, um, Stuart and Ryan, <clears throat> Gary Ostrom, and Peter and Kathleen Schwartz. They really were the ones who um, made it all possible for this evening to happen, so I'd like to also say thank you to them.